Okay, so we're diving deep into the Siamese court, right? Rituals, traditions, but also, get this, a mischievous princess. You sent these translated chapters over, and I know you're dying to dig into this relationship between Kunying, she's an orphan, learning all about court life, and then there's Princess Anilifat, who, well, she's got this way of bending the rules. It's that contrast that really grabbed me. Yeah. You've got this world, the Siamese court, all about order and hierarchy, so traditional, but then, bam, you've got cars, you've got foreign education, and a princess who'd choose a beat-up old car over, what, a royal procession. It's like tradition is trying to catch up. It's like trying to keep up with these youngsters. And you see it right away in how they live their lives, right? Chapter two, it's like this perfect picture. Kunying is practicing fruit carving, flower arranging, all those super refined skills. And her aunt, Padmika, is right there watching her every move. It's all so structured. And meanwhile, Anilifat is commandeering Zhao Kai, which is what, the old palace car? Yeah, the palace car. Just to get a ride to school with Kun Ying. Can oh. you imagine being that driver? Peeperm, I think? Stuck between royal protocol and, well, a princess who clearly makes her own rules. And Kun Ying, bless her, she tries to keep things proper, you know, but then Anilifat, she flashes those dimples, and that's it. Kun Ying's resolve just crumbles. You said it, it's like this playful tension between them that just makes their interaction so compelling right from the start. Oh, absolutely. Like that whole caterpillar thing. Oh, tell me you're not bringing up the caterpillar. Oh, it's classic. <laughs> and Nilifat brings this caterpillar to Ku Ying, totally serious about turning it into a butterfly. It's mischievous, sure, but it also shows you how curious she is. She's testing boundaries, whether it's how you're supposed to behave or, you know, the laws of nature. Remember when she questioned that proverb, the one about pushing a mortar up a mountain? Classic, Anilifat. Always questioning. Always. But for all that mischief, you can tell she's drawn to how serious Kun Ying is, how different they are. Which, of course, leads us to their little adventure sneaking out to the temple festival. Chapter 3 just throws you right into this sensory overload. Sights, sounds, smells. You can practically taste the street food, hear the music. Oh, I know. It's so vivid. And it's at the festival that the contrast between them is even more obvious. It's like the energy of the festival just explodes their differences. Kun Ying, she's anxious, totally overwhelmed, terrified of getting caught. But Anilifat, she's in her element, loving every second of it, and you can't help but get caught up in her joy. And of course, we can't forget Prick, Anilifat's servant, loyal as can be, and just as mischievous. Oh, Prick is the best. Desperate to join that flower arch dance, only held back by Anilifat, who hits her with, get this, <sighs> might attract pedophiles. Delivered, as always, with a totally straight face. Totally. But it's Prick's line, you know, the, if stealing won't work, use the king's favor. That got me. It says so much about them. Prick's not just a servant. She's a confidant, a partner in crime. She gets a Nilifat, you know, yeah. knows exactly how to handle her and the whole court situation to get what she wants. And boy, does that backfire this time. Because that little adventure, you know, it doesn't exactly go unnoticed. Chapter four, we're dropped right into the aftermath. Padmika, the aunt, she's found out about their little outing. And let's just say... She is not happy. Oh, their reactions are priceless. Kun Ying, always the rule follower. She instantly takes the blame, like it's all her fault. Shoulders all that guilt, no problem. And a Nilifat. <laughs> she jumps right in, argues that Kun Ying was practically dragged into the whole thing. And get this, she chooses to stay with Kun Ying in confinement. Talk about a power move. She could have gotten out of it easy. But no, she stays. It changes things between them, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. It's like Anilifat, used to getting her own way, is starting to see that what she really wants is something more, you know? Mm -hmm. That real connection with Kun Ying and that confinement. It becomes this unexpected chance for them to, well, let their guard down a bit. You see it in those small moments, like Anilifat sketching Kun Ying's face in the study and saying she wants Kun Ying to live with her in her dream house. It's subtle, but there is a longing there. Something more than just their usual back and forth. Right. And let's not forget Anilifat, ever the strategist, she turns their confinement into a sleepover. Classic Anilifat. Classic. Bending the rules, getting what she wants. And of course, Preek jumps right in with, if stealing won't work, use the king's favor. <sighs> it's like she reads her mind. Prick is amazing. But back to that sleepover. Chapter 6 shows us a different side of Anilifat. Endearing, but also revealing. She's drawn to Kun Ying's things, the blue ribbon, the handkerchief, everyday objects, but suddenly they mean something more. It's like she's trying to figure Kun Ying out, go beyond their usual dynamic. Like that blue ribbon, didn't it belong to Anilifat originally? Lost, found, 
and Kun Yang keeps it all this time. It's a symbol of their connection, their shared past. And that indigo handkerchief, the one Anilifat uses to wipe away Kun Ying's tears, then gives to her. Such a small thing, but so much emotion there. It shows you the empathy growing between them. Anilifat, for all her mischief, she sees Kun Ying's vulnerability and responds with this, well, this surprising tenderness. They might not fully understand it yet, all these feelings, but something big is happening between them. And this is just the beginning, because big changes are coming, and their bond, it's about to be put to the test. We were just talking about those little moments between them, those glimpses of something deeper. And it got me thinking about how much their world is about to change, because there's a separation coming, and it's going to force them to face what's really going on between them. Chapter 7. It almost throws you off at first. You get caught up in the excitement of Prince Anand's homecoming party. Anilifat and Preek are scheming to raid the palace kitchens. It's like business as usual. And then, boom, Podmika just drops this bombshell. Anilifat's going abroad to study. And the way the author does it, right, we don't hear Anilifat's reaction right away. We see it through Kun Yang, how she pulls back the sadness that just seems to settle over her. Subtle but powerful. It tells you just how much this news hits Kun Yang. Remember, her life has been so sheltered, all about routine and tradition. And Elifat, as disruptive as she can be, she's become this constant presence, a source of joy, of freedom even. The thought of her leaving, it's like this threat, pulling Kun Yin back into that rigid world she's always known. Which brings us to that scene in Chapter 8, the Maprang scene. It gets me every time. Kun Yin is making this elaborate dessert, one of an Elifat's favorites. But something's off. She's not really there, you know? There's this sadness in everything she does. Even Padmika notices it. She sees how quiet Kun Ying is, how withdrawn, and finally she just comes out and says it. You will be lonely without her. And Kun Ying, you can tell she wants to brush it off, pretend it's not a big deal, but her emotions just betray her. It's heartbreaking. And then an elephant walks in, completely oblivious, cheerful as ever. It's like watching this train wreck in slow motion, knowing you can't stop it. And just when you think, it can't get any worse. Chapter 9 throws you for a loop. We finally get Anilfat's perspective on this whole separation thing. And it's not what you'd expect. She's struggling with it, but in her own way. She's asking her brother, the first prince, trying to understand why this has to happen. And he doesn't sugarcoat it. He tells her straight up that staying in Siam would stifle her. He sees her curiosity, how she questions everything, not as flaws, but as signs that her mind is meant for bigger things. He's basically telling her this separation, this chance to learn and grow, it's not just about her journey. It's about her fulfilling her potential, becoming who she's meant to be. But it takes overhearing Kun Ying's confession, this heartbroken whisper of, Ying will be lonely, for it to really hit an Eliphat. That's the moment when the full weight of their connection, I think, really sinks in. Exactly. It's not just about academics or some grand destiny anymore. It's about realizing how much they mean to each other. An Eliphat, used to getting her way, she finally gets it. Mm -hmm. Some things, some people, you just bend to your will. And Kun Ying, faced with this life without an Eliphat, she might just discover a strength, a resilience she never knew she had. And so we get that final scene in chapter nine, the one that stays with you. Anne Lefat, about to leave for years, looks back at Kun Ying and her face is just stained with tears. It's a goodbye for sure, but it's also like this unspoken promise. It's this acknowledgement of something that goes beyond distance, beyond time. It leaves you feeling melancholic, but there's hope there too, wouldn't you say? Absolutely, it's like the author leaves us right on the edge of something new. Will they drift apart? Or will this distance actually make their bond stronger? Will this separation be what they both needed to grow to find their own paths and maybe eventually lead them back to each other? It's something to think about as you keep reading, as you do your own deep dive into this incredible story. What do you think will happen? We'd love to hear your thoughts.